stand. This Hi there, uh, I'm Cory Doctorow. I co-edit Boing Boing and I write science fiction novels. And just lately I'm about to become a publisher and I'm also a bookseller. So I understand that you're involved with an interesting project that doesn't involve a publisher? That's right. So I'm doing a new short story collection called With a Little Help. Um, the theme is that I'm getting a bunch of my friends to give me help with it. Uh, it's a free uh, ebook, as all my books have been, uh, under Creative Commons license. Um, unlike all my other books, though, I'm going to solicit donations from readers because there's no publisher to upset by soliciting donations that cuts the publisher out of the loop. Then there's a POD from Lulu, uh, four different covers. And because it's POD, I can do fun things. So if you send me a typo for the book, I'll correct it in the next copy of print and give you a footnote on the page. Uh, every month, the book will have a new appendix giving all the financials for the book to date, compared with my last one, which came from, uh, they were Thunder's Mouth when they bought the book and then PGW went under and now they're Perseus, I think. Right. They got bought out four times in, in a year. Um, and it's a very good selling book. It's still doing very well. Uh, then there's a premium hardcover bound, handbound in Clark and Well, where my office is in London. All rag paper, original end papers in every book, uh, sent by other writers. Uh, they're paper ephemera, so I have uh, like uh, watercolor paintings by Joe Haldeman, uh, Jay Lake's Cancer Diagnosis, um, Kathy Koja sent me a grade two report card, all this wonderful, wonderful paper ephemera. Uh, and then set into the cover will be an SD card with all the audio and all the text. Uh, the audio is being read aloud by all my voice actor friends. So uh, Legal Laporte's doing one, Mary Robinette Kowal, uh, uh, Will Wheaton, uh, Neil Gaiman did one live at the World Science Fiction Convention this year. All edited together, all CC licensed, all available for inclusion in people's podcasts with a pitch for a donation and to buy the book. Um, then if you want to buy the audiobook on physical media, Poddisc, who do Disc On Demand, are doing a, um, an audio, uh, you can either buy it as AUG files, which are a free alternative to MP3 that has no patents, and that I sell at cost, or if you buy the MP3 version, I'll charge you a premium for wanting the uh, encumbered version. And then uh, I had originally planned to have a super premium offering, which was for $10,000 I'd let one person commission a story. Uh, but I mentioned this over lunch with a friend who bought the story. So Mark Shuttleworth bought the story. It will be in from the beginning of the book. Um, Publishers Weekly is doing a column on it, uh, or I'm doing a column for, for PW on it, and um, there's a bunch of other kind of ancillary revenue sources, a speaking tour, um, advertisements in the book, uh, which I can rotate in and out on a monthly basis every time the book is reprinted because it's a POD, um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, I might do a book about the book when I'm done. That's great. So, it's interesting that you're not using a publisher for this. I was curious how, how you view the role of a publisher. And why is it that you're, they're not using a publisher? What, what do you think the role of a publisher, publisher should be? Well, I think that there are a bunch of things that publishers do that I can't readily replicate. So um, for one thing, they capitalize the book. So there is no capital investment in this book. I bought some paintings from artists I admired. Um, everything else is on commission or print on demand or, you know, for the, for the custom hardcovers, I'm printing and binding them in batches of 20 on order. So I, I'm, I, publishers can capitalize a project like this. Uh, they provide a lot of coordination, so I'm putting a lot of, you know, finicky administrative junk into this job. Um, there's a Flickr set of all that paper ephemera. I'm paying someone 10 pounds an hour to scan it in London because, I, I, you know, that's uh, spending 60 hours scanning this stuff is not a good productive use of my time. So there's a there's a ton of that kind of thing that's really uh, that's really important. The other thing that a publisher absolutely can do that I can't replicate is they can have a sales force make a call on every bookseller in America and uh, talk to them about why they might buy my book. Now, not every publisher does that f for not every book, but when publishers do that, that's a really big deal. And then finally, publishers have specialized knowledge not about um, what to do, but about who to ask what to do. So with my last book, Little Brother uh, from Tor, uh, they hired a YA specialist marketing consultant that did all kinds of amazing things, like they booked me into schools uh, that had relationships with um, local booksellers that were BookSense accounts. Um, and I would do like five schools a day, two or three hundred copies a day for a couple of weeks right after the book came out, which immediately put it on the BookSense best bestseller list and triggered an order of three to five copies at a thousand stores across America. When you have that many copies, you face them, right? Mm -hmm. Or you put them or you put them on a table. Sure. Um, and you know, they even they sent me on a uh, to a bookstore in Mequon, Wisconsin. I was like, why am I in Mequon, Wisconsin? They said because this store supplies the tuck shops for every summer camp in Wisconsin, where the richest, most influential kids in America go. They'll all go back to school in September. So you know, I could have hired this freelance marketing firm as well as Tor could have, but I didn't even know they existed, right? So that's something, that's, that's another thing they have a specialized knowledge.
But that is interesting in terms of whether authors in the future you think will be working with outside consultants um, with respect to you know, individual specialties such as PR, hiring somebody for PR or copy editing versus going to a publisher. Do you think that's going to evolve at all? Well, you know, in some ways it's not far off from what we have, right? Because publishers are all working with freelancers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, almost everyone involved in the production of a book will be a freelancer uh, to some approximation of everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, writers are often, their books are often bought these days on the strength of some special skill or rep reputation or position that they bring to it. You know, uh, certainly the celebrity book is, mm -hmm. is exemplary sure. of this. And so what they're essentially doing is they are, they are hiring the publisher to do a subset of their overall publicity. Right? Um, certainly people who sell books that they intend to do lecture tours off in the back of, if they're, if they're writing a business book, for example. Mm -hmm. Those people are essentially outsourcing a piece of their overall business to a publisher. So it's not far off to say, okay, well right now I, there's someone who's a production manager or an editor at my house who puts together all of these pieces for me and I put together the pieces that I feel comfortable putting together. And and which is the status quo right now where I we're moving to something where instead I say to the editor, these are the pieces that I want, you take a piece of that and so on. We have a model for that that hasn't been super great for artists, which is the music industry, where they give you a, a giant amount of money and then they charge you for the entire production. And often they make you use their people um, at a rate that they set. It starts to look a lot more like one of those sleazy book doctor slash vanity houses where it's like, you know, you need an editorial service, which we're going to charge you thousands of dollars for. But surely somewhere between like the raw graft that is the that is the music industry and kind of the, the one size fits all that is the publishing industry, there's something that's a sweeter spot. I'm curious, um, with, by co-editing of Boing Boing, you've really established this unbelievable online community, and I'm just curious how you've managed to, to cultivate this following. I think that there's, you know, it, it's kind of self-serving to say it, but I think that it's about being genuine. Like, I, I, unlike writing for a magazine or or a traditional print uh, venue, or even online venue, I have never written something because I thought a reader would want to read it. I've written something because I thought it was interesting. So what, what I've ended up with is a bunch of people who are interested more or less in the same stuff that I'm interested in. Um, and so instead of trying to figure out how to serve an audience, I figured out how to find the audience who wants what I have to serve. And and that, and, and we've all done it, all four of us as the, the principal editorial staff on Boing Boing. And that's a huge difference, and it's only possible because there's so little capital necessary to run Boing Boing. I mean, it cost nothing for the first several years, and then our bandwidth bills hit the point where it was $50 a month. We, we didn't even, um, all, all four of us in our business manager had never been in a room until we'd been around for six years. Uh, Incredible. You know, I, so you know, this is how low it cost. This is how little it cost to start something. Didn't make a lot of money. Didn't cost a lot of money, mm -hmm. and was you know an incredibly useful thing as just part of my writing practice. Just keeping track of all the things that were interesting that I might someday put in a book, which is more or less how I use Boing Boing. That was super effective for me. I'm curious that you had mentioned earlier that you um, you see yourself as a bookseller. Yeah. I well, so I review books on Boing Boing, and when I review a book that I like, I put an Amazon link in with an affiliate ID. Um, through those affiliate IDs, I sell about 25,000 books a year. 25,000 books yeah. a year. So I also presumably sell a bunch of books that are more like a reviewer would, where people just go off and buy them from other places. And I, you know, I know a lot of our readers are savvy enough to have um, uh, affiliate tag rewriters, that when they go to the book, it actually rewrites it with the affiliate tag of a charity of their choice and stuff. So I wouldn't even see those sales. but. But I do get a, just a you know a giant load of sales, and it's certainly it's a nice source of income for me as well. What advice would you have for an author who um, is trying to get a community around its book, or what? Uh, how do well, you? So most of the time, when people ask me questions like that, my first question is, "Have you written a book yet?" And the answer is often no. So my my first piece of advice for any writer is to finish a book, um, and and then generally my second piece of advice is to sell the book to a publisher, and then. The number of writers who then want to ask my advice, you know, when you sort of whittle out the people who haven't, who haven't sold a book and who haven't finished a book, that's a much smaller, because I think that, like, th dreaming about what you'll do to market your book is way more interesting than, like, writing your book most of the time. But when you get down to the people who've actually written and sold a book and want some advice, um, I guess... I guess the, it's, it's, it's very trite, but I guess the best advice I have is be yourself. Um, it's, it's, it's much more gratifying to find an audience who want 
to uh, read the stuff that you want to write and to try and write some stuff for an audience that may exist out there. That's great. Well, thank you so thank much, you. Corey. This is yeah. really fascinating. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right.